So the master says, where are the other nine? What does that mean, Jeremiah? Where are the other nine? I healed ten people. One comes back. Whenever the master asks a question, it's very significant. It's always a teaching moment with the master. Every because he's got, he's rabbi. That's what he is. He's a teacher. Now there are nine nine people don't show up, but ten people were healed. So he asked where the other nine because he, he, he wanted to see, and it's basically required of them, that, that they not just get healed, but to love God. That's the point. They have confidence in healing, but only one of them wants to love God. That's the obvious uh, uh, um, um, situation. I think it's quite clear. So you had nine people who were just like the gentleman or whoever this is, uh, the profile in 13. They had confidence in God's powers. And, and the Bible goes into it, we won't go into it right now, where the Bible says essentially Israel was healed of all different kinds of diseases and problems, but most of them went right back to the same lifestyle and their situation was worse than it was before. Why? Because healings were not necessarily what God was out to do. He was out to save souls. And he saved souls by doing miracles and teaching the gospel and people loving God with the opportunity to do so. Irrespective of whether you were healed or not, uh, there, there has to be some sort of a response of love. That's the whole point. The Master said, you have not the love of God in yourselves. So a lot of these Pharisees and people who were healed, they're, they're all in the same bunch. They see the power of God, they're near the throne of God, and yet they're not serving the Lord with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what's required of you. Whether you're healed, whether you're a, whether you're a Pharisee, it doesn't matter. Now, some people who were healed, quite obviously, let's talk about this for a minute, because this gets a little deep. A lot of people who are healed... They automatically started loving God. They were, they were loving God before they were healed, more or less. They were open, they were humble, and they, and, and they were very sensitive, and they were obviously in some sort of pain or problem, and yet, yet their heart was still towards God. They just didn't want to get healed. They wanted God to love them, and that's what they were doing. They, they had an open heart to the surgery of the Master, and open heart surgery they were ready for, and, and, and their healing was also basically salvation. It gets a little complicated because the master tells a few people, he calls them daughter, the woman with the issue of blood. He, he tells her that he calls her daughter. Okay, if the Lord calls you daughter, you're in like Flint. Okay. <laughs> that means that that lady is basically saved at that point for sure. And, and, but even though she didn't have to come back like the other ten or the other nine I see a different format for different people under different scenarios. It makes it a little complicated, but we'll let that go. Let's go on to 14 now. As I wanted to mention the other nine here. Where are the other nine? If the Lord asks for the other nine, uh, it's common sense, or it's, it's simple, uh, that he wants to know where they are and he wants them there. That's the point. You know, you, you got something from God, okay, uh, let, let, let's have some gratitude, boys. It is good to give thanks unto the Lord and, and to sing praises to our God. It's good to give thanks. You better believe it is. And these nine gentlemen are not doing it. They're, they're going off into the wild. The same thing these TV preacher types and this prototype here in chapter 13, the same it's the same profile, it, and it applies to their minions, too, because they because birds of a feather flock together. They're also greedy, and they want to walk through the pews and so forth. They're, they're still greedy as all get out, and they're looking at you, and you're looking at them, and you can, and the Lord will re reveal to you that these people are not real. You know, so, and, and it's a very unfortunate subject, but let's let that go, because we're going to get positive now. Because we're confident that all of you out there 
These three abide in you. That's confidence in today, confidence in the coming of the Lord, and, and that will basically automatically have the love of God in you. Why? Because you're looking forward to being with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're not storing up treasures on earth. You're storing up treasures where your heart is. You're storing up treasures where your heart is. This is a profile in 13 of someone who does not have their heart in heaven. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. I don't want return for my church services. I don't need to exact or think about it. That's what, that's what Gentiles do and basically what animals do. A lot of animals will care for you as long as you care for them. But if they get, but if they get hungry, they might eat you. That's why they're called animals. They don't have a conscience. They don't know thou shalt not murder. They don't know God personally. They may show affection, but watch out. Watch out for tomorrow. The affections might change. Same profile for a human Gentile in general. That's why, that's why David called Goliath an uncircumcised Philistine. He has no caring. He has no intelligence. He's just an animal. And how dare this uncircumcised Philistine come against the people of God? How dare he come and attack us? <clears throat> we have a shield about us, the Lord Jesus Christ promised to us. We just looked at it in Exodus and Deuteronomy to Moses. You keep my commandments and you do what I tell you to do, Moses, you and the boys here, then it's going to be good for you in general. Now, for us in the New Testament, we take those scriptures and we apply them to the Master's teachings, and we, we and we tweak those scriptures, and we and we and we we uh, we refine those scriptures to apply to the New Testament doctrine that we live by, which is we're not going to necessarily look forward to a good America or a good home here. We're looking forward to Revelation chapter 21 when I'm with the person who loves me. That's what I'm looking forward to. God promised Moses protection and so forth. That's good and hunky-dory. However, when we get to the New Testament, that's not necessarily the text at all. We, we have to tweak that, that, uh, uh, that scenario. We're focused on blessed are you because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then the disciples were very excited because they had power over devils and demons in order to cast them out and to bring peace of mind to people who are trapped, psychotic, and violent, and whatever you want to say. They're sitting there now free and going to the temple, and they're normal people, and they're happy, and their relatives are smiling. Okay, that's wonderful, boys, uh, but, but, uh, uh, but rather rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what you really should be, should be focusing on. It doesn't mean I don't want you to be happy about the power you've been given, notwithstanding. That's fine, boys. That's fine, guys. And, and one reason why I don't want you basically to get too excited about your powers right now, because the same devils that you're casting out, those are the ones that are going to kill you in about 30 years, boys. I'm going to let them crucify you upside down. So that's why I don't, want you get, I don't want you to get too excited about the powers you have now and the easy road you've got of authority because the same people that are basically your, your, um, uh, you know, your, your, your exercising power over, they're going to murder you. Christianity is a little complicated. You can't just think along the lines of, oh, I'm healed and everything's beautiful. No. Uh, the chances are the woman who had the blood issue, and Jesus called her daughter, uh, he, he, the chances are this is, there's some difficulty in her future. Okay, the, the, that, that, that simple grammar, okay? It's not very difficult for you to comprehend what I just said. Now let's move on as we wrap this up, as we are really rolling here in 1 Corinthians, and let's get to 14 now as we kind of beat that up a little bit. This is one of the most important parts of your Bible. Because Paul is giving you an overview of what Christianity is. 
And this, and this is one of the scriptures I use. Uh, uh, this is 46, 13, 13. This is one of the scriptures I use as the basis for this ministry pertaining to the, the, the concept of faith. Because now faith is, is a little more complicated. The Christian faith is not just faith, but it's also hope. What's the difference in those two terms, Jeremiah? That's why, that's why I have a faith lesson here for you. Now, we, we just put up baby steps. For those of you who want to, want to just continue in some sort of very low-level academic comprehension of your salvation, and you just go ahead with, I repented and I'm baptized, and Jesus died for me, and I want to love him. And you can leave it at that uh, uh, for a long period of time. That's between you and the Lord. Some people don't really have the pen and paper and, and, and the, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the inclination to go too much farther than that. That's why I have baby steps up here. What we're getting into now is we're getting into intermediate and advanced Christianity. For example, I'm telling you what the Christian faith is. The Christian faith is not one faith. That's why Paul said in, in Hebrews 11, uh, piggybacking on this scripture, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, there you go. Now faith is hope. How did faith become hope? What is that transition, Jeremiah, in the cognate? Well, that's what I'm here for. Now, let's move on as, I, as I'm going to share a lot of this with you. If we're going to get into the do's and don'ts, okay, we're going to finish 13. 13 is hard to get through because it is the, one of the cornerstone scriptures in your Bible. This is ginormous when we get to 12 and 13, especially 13. Spiritual gifts is rather easily, easily, easily assessed because God's going to show you what to do, basically, as far as a, a job in the church. A lot of people are going to be given a job, and, th and they're going to go online and forget about it and go to Starbucks or, you know, go on Amazon and then uh, stare in the mirror and work out or something, and, and they're going to be what we might call carnal Christians, and they're going to put themselves on the bubble of salvation. They'll turn a TV guy on, you know, and, and, and get an astrology book out or something, which the Bible says do not do. It's quite clear the Bible says stay away from all of that stuff. Leave it alone. And if you play with it, you're playing with your soul, more or less. Because it, it gives you power. Let me, let me share this before we, before we get into this. A lot of people do things because of power. In America, they, they, they highlighted the term self-esteem. Now, self-esteem is something that some people will not let go. When you go to the church, you, you have to throw all of your self-esteem under the bus. All of your audacity, all of your pride, it has to go under the bus. You have to say, bye. And one way you can, you can hold on to self-esteem is to do the things that God told you not to do, such as staring in the mirror, working out too much and all of this, and, and uh, uh, getting yourself fixed all the time, um, uh, looking to the future and calling yourself something special, like calling yourself uh, a Sagittarius or something. And, and what this does is it's all more pride. Instead of you being a team member, which is a servant in, in chapter 12, you're the opposite of that. You're, you're not a team member. You're special. You're, you're in the mirror. You know, you, you, you must identify yourself as something special, and, and, and you're loving yourself. And, and, and unfortunately, me magazines in America are, are just a, a horrible thing that, that, that's a big part of America. I used to go to the grocery store and had me magazines all over the place. This is Babylon, where you look at you, you look at yourself, and, and you gain a, a satisfaction and joy from your image and your abilities. That's what you're doing. And, and that's called damnation. That's what you're doing to yourself. Paul gives a good psych psychological profile. Uh, we looked at earlier in Romans chapter 1. We won't go there right now, but uh, it's horrible to see people doing this. To live this way. Let, let, let's move on. Let's look at do's and don'ts in 13, then we're going to move on. I was going to go to 14, 
But let's let that go. I, I, um, uh, I mentioned I wanted to go to 13 and do the do's and don'ts. And, and, and let's get back to do's and don'ts. Because I might skip 14 and go back to my notes. Okay? What do we do here? The same thing we do in Matthew chapter 5. Which is the right attitude. Attitude is behavior. What are your attributes? What are the things that you do and say? Are you practicing the proper behaviors? That's all this means. Matthew chapter 5. Same thing as 13. And let's go to Matthew 5 as we bounce around a little here. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, mourn, uh, 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 meek, hunger and thirst after righteousness, merciful, pure at heart, peacemakers, and those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So right away the Master is telling you that you're blessed if you are persecuted. Wow. And this is called straight up, as they say here in America. This is straight up, you're happy if you're persecuted. So what does that mean, Jeremiah? That means you're happy if you're persecuted because, because of the future, not while you're being persecuted. I'll say it again. A lot of you, listen carefully. The people who endure, which is what Paul's going to say in 13, love endures. That's the first thing he teaches. If you have the love of God in you and it remains in you, you will endure his plan for you. Do you understand what I just said? That's the point. Love is patient. It endures. I learned that from my parents. Both of them could have been movie stars going up and down the street with fancy cars, with, uh, with convertibles. Going to Santa Monica Pier and, and enjoying life to the fullest. Instead, they, 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 they have diapers, they go to work 10 hours a day, and, and that's called love. That, that's what that means. And neither one of them quit and ran to Hollywood. Love endures. It's patient. If somebody leaves you and runs off, runs off on you, they don't love you. That's just simple math. They might love you down the road, but they're not loving you if they run off. That's, that's why the Bible says that there, there is no shadow of turning with the Lord. He's not going to turn away. Now, you might turn from him, and he'll dump you. That's a different point. But he's not going to be quick to turn from you. That's quite obvious. Or it should be obvious to you. I hope it is. Persecuted for the, 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 for the promotion of the gospel. Okay, that's blessed. Have you seen a blessed t-shirt in the 99 cent store that says, Blessed are you because you're persecuted? No, you won't. Because we're in the falling away. That's why. The only, the only way you'll see the word blessed is if God gives you something good and some candy and you go to Disney World. That's blessed. But that's not what the word blessed means. The narrative is twisted. Basically, America is one big giant heresy. The world is one big giant heresy because the church is not teaching what I just told you. Blessed are you who are persecuted because you're doing the right thing and living the right way. For, for your own kingdom soul ownership and for the ownership of others as you spread righteous life and the, the attack on sin. And, and the people who are out there wild, they're not going to like you. The, the master said they hated me. They'll hate you also. John said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. So, so here we have people hating us. And he said, You're, that blessed are you. Did you read 510? Blessed are you. How can you be happy being persecuted? Huh? That requires foresight. 
it requires vision. You're going to have to think here. That's the point. The master is redefining the word blessed. He's clarifying it, more or less. He's not sugarcoating it. The reason why a lot of people are famous on TV is because they sugarcoat Christianity, that there is no fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus Christ, and they're happy and let's all dance and go to Alaska and have shrimp. That's a false narrative. That's a heretic. A proper teacher will teach you just what I just said in 510. 40.5.10. And that's a lot to do with the first thing Paul says in 13, which is love endures everything. That's why we teach you to remain in the love of God. If you tell me that you don't like persecuted for righteousness sake, you don't love God. That's the point. It is basically the crux of Christianity. It is the first and last slice of living bread that you're going to digest and think about and ruminate and to soak in. You need to soak in living bread if you're going to live forever. He who eats this bread will never see death. So we teach this, and that's why love endures everything. The first thing Paul says in, in Romans, uh, in a part of the Corinthians 13. Put those two together, persecution and endurance. What do you come away with? The basics of living bread that you're going to do, as Jesus told John's mother, you, you, you and your boys want to go to heaven? Can you drink the same cup I can drink and, and go, deal with the same epitodes, part, pardon me, episodes, episodes of persecution? Can you do it? Are you going to man up and woman up around here? Because that's really what this all comes down to over and over again. I can't take it anymore. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. You, you don't love God because love endures everything. I don't want to be persecuted. So it goes back to the parable of the sower. Everything is all tied in together here, people. Brethren, you beloved of Jesus Christ, who anticipate being with the master, that everything ties in together. The parable of the sower. Two people quit because one of them wanted to party, and the other one thought, I don't want to hang around Africans like Livingston and get malaria and, and get shot at and, and have lions walk by me. I'm going to go back to London. I'm going to eat pudding and be very well dressed. As, as, as Stanley observed, uh, his friends, Livingston's friends, were pudding eaters, and they were sitting around, uh, sitting, staring in the mirror and enjoying luxury of London. But Stanley wasn't going to be like the, the pudding eaters. He said, I'm going back to Africa. He even left a beautiful fiancé. Uh, 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 uh. He left a beautiful fiancé. He left the pudding eaters to go back into the jungle and deal with everything. Muslims were, 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 were uh, taking slave trade in the eastern part of Africa at this time, and, and he almost got murdered by them. You know, and so it, it goes on and on here with, okay, uh, okay, I'm not going to be offended. The master said, ashamed and offended. Okay, ashamed and offended in what? Persecution. Love doesn't quit. That's why Jude said, remain in the love of God. That's why Jesus said, abide in my love, you'll keep my commandments. We, we just went over some of the crux uh, commandments right there. We're just looking at it. And Paul's giving you a profile of people who endure all of this. They're the winners here. Paul says, behave well. Love always behaves well. Love prioritizes other people, not yourself. Love hungers and thirsts after righteousness and, and finds satisfaction when things are done correctly. Christian people in general, they really like to see things done right. And we rejoice when something is done correct. The devil likes to blow things up. He, he likes to throw a monkey wrench in the works. He, he wants to put something wrong with your car. He, he wants to be a, a, there, there, there to be a, loop, a leak in your roof. He, he wants things not to go properly. That's what he thinks about all day long. That's why he's called a destroyer. He, he wants to blow things up. He, he wants to take a human being and destroy the human being. And he's going to do it, and God's going to let him do it. 
However, everybody who, who, who destroys human beings and destroys the earth and, and they're destroyers and, and they like to see people crying and hurt people like Hitler did and so forth, thousands and thousands of mothers crying and, and all of this. Everybody who participates in any of these activities, the, the Libra scale is going to hit them hard. But the book, of Revela the book of Revelation says, give them double. Some people are going to get double what they put out. They have a saying down in in Texas, what goes around comes around. So love can never do anything as far as failure goes. Because what you're doing is, is you're learning how to be like God, which is love can't really have any problems. That's the point Paul's making here in, in, in 46.13 here, is, is that he is telling you that people who actually love God they can't, they can't dress him properly. They can't hoard money. They can't do any of these things. They can't fail at anything. They can't fail at being nice. They can't fail at being enduring. They can't fail at behaving well, even under stress. They can't fail at preferring other people uh, and, and, and loving people. They can't fail at any of these things. We talked about that earlier, about how God, he wants to develop his character in you, putting on the image of Jesus Christ. Now, whether or not that gets done uh, and you live long enough to, for, for, for that character to be built in you and so forth, that's between you and the Lord and so forth. Here, here's the don'ts. Here's what we don't do. This is what the world does. We don't envy people. We're not cocky and boastful about anything. We're not selfish. Me, me, me magazines. Um, we have self-control. The world doesn't have self-control. We don't ponder evil. You might get an evil thought, but your job is to get it out of your head. ASAP. Uh, love and charity, it, it's always confident in everything that's good. That's the point. Also, love is persuaded that doing the right thing is the best way to go. Love is always wise. Love can never be unwise because love is caring and intelligence. That's what it is. Now in America, unfortunately, since America is basically half Babylon, they, they always try to mix up love with, with affection and try to bring love down to the affection level. That's not what the Bible calls love. That's animal, backslidden, wild people love. Watching Jerry Springer or something on TV where the people are wild. They, 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 I love Cindy today. I beat her up yesterday. It's a circus. That's not love. And they'll use those terms. For, for hundreds of years here in America, or, or tens of years here in America, I, I've turned the TV on, and everybody says, I love my car, I love my cat, I love my mustard. And so that, what, what they're doing is they're saying is that they really don't know where to put their affections. And that's what confusion is. That's why the Bible calls Babylon, Babylon, because it means confusion. You don't really know the truth. I had a student one day tell me that he that he loves ketchup or something, and I and I and I told the student, I don't remember his name, and I, I told him I said you don't love ketchup, you love your mother. I said you like ketchup, ketchup can't love you. And the student started laughing because it was a very bright group of students. They picked up on what I was saying. Sometimes some young, young Americans can be awfully smart. They picked up right away that he was wrong, and I was doing it in a very kind manner. We were not picking on him. He was smiling, too, because he understood that you don't love things. Because they can't love you back. And when you use that terminology, 
you're basically entering into the uh, the dumb zone. Now we all do it. We, we weren't picking on the on, on the child. It's just that we were making a point that that it's not intelligent for you to declare that you love something that can't love you back. God can love you back, and humans who are created in the image of God, they can love you back intelligently and with the agape love of Jesus Christ. That's what you, that, that's who you declare you love. Any other declaration is a sign that you don't love God, you don't want to love God, and that you are basically psychotic. You're mentally undisturbed. That's what we call Bible study sound doctrine. Because they're sound principles. We, we, we don't go off on a tangent of mental retardation and psychosis here, ever. We're always rooted and grounded in reality and science. Okay, I'll take a break. Maranatha! Jesus is coming and we are anticipating. He, he is... Uh, he is coming for those who love his appearing. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We are loving his appearing. And you better believe it. I'll be right back. Maranatha. <laughs> 